meeting you for the last of the series of gastrointestinal uh, uh, webinars. First of all, I must thank um, Sharma and Kanika Sharma and uh, the group of Oriel people for having given me this opportunity to meet you all. It's the greatest pleasure for me to meet vets at any time. So thank you so much, uh, Sharma. Uh, now it's a pleasure for me to share uh, something about uh, the last uh, topic of the GIA series, that is, uh, um, you know, the, the last one today, we are going to see just now. Yeah, good. Uh, again, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so today we will see about disease of the uh, pancreas. And uh, uh, most of the vets are not very much familiar with this organ for several reasons, including me. I would have not seen very many cases. So the problem being acute pancreatitis, the incidence in India is very less. If you take all developed countries, it's uh, one of the most important critical care uh, subject when it comes to uh, pancre uh, pancreatitis, acute pancreatitis. Invariably, if on a Monday morning, most of the uh, vet veterinary hospitals in the developed countries will have dogs presented with uh, acute abdominal pain and vomiting. And invariably, it must be acute pancreatitis because the weekend celebrations, they feed a lot of uh, leftovers to their pets and they lead on to acute pancreatitis. Somehow, we are not seeing this case to that extent in India, probably because we might not be having obese dogs in comparison with them because this, uh, this pancreatitis affects mostly obese dogs. That is number one. In fact, we took up the study for a master's degree and we caught out of feral dogs, which was uh, admissible at that time. We were permitted to do so at that time. And uh, with a stomach tube, we fed uh, 500 ml of coconut oil to induce pancreatitis. To our surprise, the absolutely the next day the no dog was uh, normal. In fact, more energetic because of uh, more uh, fat. And uh, there are no indications of pancreatitis, either clinically or biochemically. Subsequently, we learned that these are also related to genetically inherited disease in certain terriers and, you know, schnozers and such as breeds. So probably because of that, we don't get to see acute pancreatitis. Supposing you veterinarian, somebody has seen, must be definitely good. So that is one reason. Next is exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. This again, we do definitely see this uh, case. Uh, these are limited to mostly to German shepherds. So we do not see uh, much in other breeds. That is number one. Whether it is pancreatitis or exocrine pancreatic insufficiency, in both these cases, the diagnostic criteria, the hallmarks of this disease are not well represented. For example, acute pancreatitis, there are no markers like, you know, like blood tests or blood biochemistry is not going to reveal acute pancreatitis as a diagnosis. Even your, uh, when, uh, your radiography is only about 30 to 40 percent sensitive. Your ultrasound, though you can see clearly the uh, pancreas, still is about 60 percent only sensitive and specific for a diagnosis of acute pancreatitis. So you can do only uh, trips in uh, like uh, immunoreactivity and, um, um, you know, um, uh, and lipase uh, inhibitors, all these things you can do, which are lacking. Snap test for, you know, um, acute pancreatitis. These are all just now coming into our uh, practice. So with the result, we are not been seeing much of this uh, pancreatitis or exocrine pancreatitic uh, disease in our practice. But nevertheless, exocrine pancreatic uh, insufficiency is much more common than acute pancreatitis. The next thing I want to tell you is, Always pancreas, liver, and GI system are involved together, both anatomically as well as clinically. So whenever you have suspect any problem with uh, you know stomach, or when you have any problem with uh, liver, or any problem with you should suspect and rule out all other organs which are in contact always. So this is another important thing. So the anatomy of pancreas, if you see, is very clearly indicated. It's got a, uh, you know, a left arm and the right arm uh, and connected by a body. 
the left arm generally consists of islets of langer hands which produces um, glucagon and insulin and the right arm uh, gives acinar cells which produce enzymes and this pancreas is in close contact with the duodenum and the stomach and therefore whenever it is inflamed it is adhesed with the complete uh, duodenum and the peritoneal cavity is adhesed so that is another biggest problem we always see when you open the exploratory laparotomy uh, we do to see the swan lot of additions are there and you have a common bile duct which comes from the liver and joins the duodenum via the duodenal papilla and similarly the pancreatic duct also opens near the major duodenal papilla both of them join and uh, enter the duodenum however in dogs you have a extra hepatic i mean pancreatic duct which opens slightly uh, further away in a minor duodenal papilla so this is the reason the difference between this and in a dog and cat in cats any obstructive uh, um, hepatic disease will also cause problem in pancreas but not so in dogs even human beings also generally the common etiology for pancreatitis is uh, you know gallbladder stones and alcoholism induced hepatitis these are two most important reason in human beings to cause pancreatitis so they are very much connected in dogs however we have a separate pancreatic duct so need not necessarily be always have a problem but definitely the major bile duct and the pancreatic duct joins the duodenum of the same level so there can be a reflex of uh, duodenal juice or a bile uh, juice into the uh, you know pancreas and cause problem so this is alone is important from this anatomical picture so this is the um, stomach and the, you know the pancreas lies between the fundus and the uh, duodenum so uh, i just want to show you the anatomical relationship in case when you look in for surgical problems related uh, pancreatitis you should know this anatomy so this is the uh, uh, pancreas and the uh, acinar cells in the pancreas uh, which is connected by the pancreatic duct this picture alone is enough to completely tell about the pathogenesis which is more important for me to now tell you because this acinus secretes these enzymes all the enzymes which digest protein fat carbohydrate uh, ribonucleic acids all these things are secreted in the acinus okay but if they are in the active form how they digest protein and fat similarly they will auto digest pancreas also so they are all in the form of a zymogen granules which are in the inactive form so they are secreted and taken by the pancreatic duct and secreted into the duodenal opening into the small intestines at the small intestines there are some brush border uh, cells which secrete enterokinase which activate this enzymes first it activates trypsin from uh, you know uh, in, before converting into trypsinogen it activates trypsin the activated trypsin activates all other proteases lipases everything and they all become active in the intestines and meanwhile all this uh, secretions in the pancreatic uh, duct uh, is uh, combined with uh, uh, bicarbonates and watery secretions to reduce the ph because these enzymes will be degraded by the gastric ph therefore they are all diluted with the uh, bicarbonate solution before reaching the um, duodenum i think i'm uh, explained enough about this enzyme which is in the inactive form in the acinus which gets activated only when it goes into the intestines so what we will we will know is so once there is an uh, inflammation of the pancreas okay this gets activated inside the acinar cells itself so they start digesting the pancreatic cells and causes severe inflammation that is what is a uh, pathogenesis is about so in general pancreatic enzymes amylase um, you know uh, trypsin chymotrypsin carboxypeptidase amino peptidase uh, ribonucleic acids all are uh, you know uh, synthesized uh, and uh, stored and secreted in the duodenum by the pancreatic cells acinar cells 
So the mechanism preventing activation of trypsin in the pancreas, I told you, they are all in the form of zymogen granules in the stored. They are secreted and stored as zymogen granules in the acinar of the pancreatic cells. The enterokinase secretes in the intestine certain uh, enzymes which activates the uh, first uh, the um, trypsin. Then the trypsin activates all other uh, enzymes. And there are also trypsin inhibitors, which are secreted by this enterokinase. So the trypsin inhibitors inhibits the trypsin when they are in the pancreas. So in any pathology, what happens, this, uh, you know, uh, gets activated when they are in the uh, pancreas. And the trypsin inhibitors are also utilized for, uh, you know, uh, stopping the uh, trypsin. And therefore, they eventually go into a cascade of problems. This is the pathogenesis, which we will see again. So the uh, enzymes which are uh, inactive uh, zymogens in the pancreas are trypsinogen, chymotrypsinogen, protease, uh, pro-carboxypeptidase and pro-pospidolipidase. All are converted into trypsin, chymotrypsin, elastylase, carboxypeptidase and phospholipase in the intestines when they come in contact with the uh, intestinal juice. Then only they get converted. Similarly, pro-colipase becomes colipase and enzyme alpha amylase and classical pancreatic lipase are uh, in the active form secreted by the gland. And the inhibitor, pancreatic secretory trypsin inhibitor is again by, uh, secreted by the uh, intro uh, sites of the intestines. So this uh, trypsinogen uh, uh, gets converted into trypsin with the help of enteropeptidase which is secreted in the intestines. Similarly, all other uh, zymogens like trypsinogen and chymotrypsinogen get converted into active enzymes which do their job of, uh, you know, emulsifying and absorbing protein, fat and um, carbohydrates. So the left side, what you see is a normal one where the zymogen granules, uh, nucleus alone are stored in the uh, pancreas. In the right side, you see abnormal, uh, um, you know, uh, interaction with zymogen granules and lysosomes, and they become abnormal vacuoles, which they attack the pancreatic cells. This happens once there is a stimulus uh, and trypsin is activated inside the pancreas. So now, what are the different types of uh, pancreatitis? So classification, there are several classification by different authors. Most of the uh, books follow what is followed in human beings, acute pancreatitis and chronic pancreatitis. Acute pancreatitis means that there's a sudden onset, there are no permanent uh, pathological change and it overcomes early clinical signs and becomes normal. This is acute peritonitis, pancreatitis. Chronic pancreatitis, there is a continuous inflammatory um, episodes which makes an irreversible morphological changes leading on to fibrosis and atrophy of the pacinar cells and possibly leads to permanent impairment of function of the pancreas. This is one way of calculation. Another way of seeing is mild and severe. Mild is there are no systemic signs and severe you have systemic signs like systemic inflammatory response syndrome, multiple organ dysfunction, you know, coagulopathies, all these things you see in severe uh, conditions. And there's another way of looking at classifying pancreatitis with complication and without complications. With complications, you have cyst in the, uh, you know, um, uh, pancreas where it is formed. There's inflammation and hemorrhage in the uh, pancreas. Uh, there's, uh, you know, uh, peritonitis caused by um, inflamed um, pancreas. These are all with complications. Of course, other things like uh, SIRS, MODS, and you know all those things, all with complications. No complication, they just exhibit signs of vomiting and dehydration, and they become all right by giving rest to the pancreas. So mild means uh, there is multi no multi-system failure, and uh, uncomplicated recovery is there. And chronic pancreatitis, uh, there is a morphological change, subclinical loss of exocrine function is there. Severe, in acute pancreatitis, there is multi-system failure, complications like pseudocysts and abscesses in the pancreas. And uh, in chronic pancreatitis, severe morphological changes 
and clinical exocrine pancreatic insufficiency or diabetes mellitus if the other horn also is affected. So to know the pathophysiology, just we will go through roughly what happens when these enzymes are activated when they are in the pancreas. Trypsin activation activates all other proteases, all other enzymes are activated by trypsin, that's a starting point. It causes coagulation fibronolysis leading on to disseminated intravascular coagulation, that is what is called DIC. Phospholipase uh, uh, A2, it hydrolyzes cell membrane phospholipids, it uh, causes pulmonary surfactant degradation, demyelination, cell necrosis and liberation of toxic substances such as myocardial depressant factor leading to respiratory distress, neurological signs of pancreatic encephalopathy, cardiac diseases, all these things are all because of phospholipase being activated. Elastase, so elastase in, is involved in uh, establishing the blood vessel walls. So when they are activated, you know, the degrades elastin in blood vessels and you have hemorrhage, edema and respiratory distress. Chymotrypsin, activation of this, uh, uh, you know, um, generates uh, oxygen free radicals and these oxygen uh, derived free radicals start uh, destroying the healthy cells. So that is what is the chymotrypsin doing when it is activated. Calcarinin, it, um, you know, stimulates uh, kinin production. So what does kinin do? Vasodilatation, pancreatic edema, hypotension, shock. So complement cell membrane damage, aggregation of leukocytes because uh, neutrophils and macrophages are, uh, uh, you know, um, brought to the site and they cause the biggest problem. Pancreatic lipase, fat hydrolysis, local fat necrosis, hypocalcemia. So these are all the pathophysiology which is happening because of these enzymes being activated before when they are in the pancreas. So trypsin is inactivated. This is followed by inactivation of other enzymes. Self-destruction of pancreas happens, leads to inflammation of pancreas, secretion of inflammatory mediators like interleukins, uh, tumor uh, necrotizing factors, etc. And uh, inflammation spreads to respiratory and renal system. Activation of blood coagulation and clotting factors happen. Blood vessels become leaky, become SERS disease, systemic inflammatory response syndrome disease, and consumption of protease inhibitors leads further uh, action of uh, all these enzymes leading on to disseminated intravascular coagulation and shock. So we should know when we see cases of uh, pancreatitis, we should know all this pathogenesis. So you can expect acute respiratory syndrome because of all the changes in the pulmonary uh, surface, because of the change in surfactants, because of bleeding tendencies, because of, uh, you know, um, clot formation, all these things there can be an acute respiratory distress syndrome. And similarly, you can expect renal failure. There can be acetemia starting. There can be um, a primary uh, pre-renal acetemia because of dehydration, because of vomiting. There can be increase in burn and as well. But subsequently, if it goes into shock and sepsis, and it can go into permanent acute renal failure, where it is because of some other uh, problem, not because of dehydration. So. Generally, whenever a case is presented to you, where you find banan creatine elevated, you give fluid therapy. After the fluid therapy, if the banan creatine is not come back to normalcy, that means it is going into acute kidney injury and chronic kidney injury. <laughs> if it comes back to normalcy, <coughs> it's because of dehydration. So, okay, same thing holds good here. So, you should see pancreatic problem as a multi-organ failure. You will have to look into lungs, you have to look into renal, you have to look into, look into all uh, leaky blood vessels. So all these things you'll have to look into while you're seeing acute pancreatitis. So what are the etiological factors? Same I told you, there are different etiological factors. All of them have a problem in con uh, activating trypsinogen uh, into trypsin. So the trypsin uh, activates other proteases and uh, which does the tissue damage, coagulation, fibrinolysis, complement, calicinin, kinin, all these uh, cascades follow later. So what happens? These effects range from mild GI signs like decreased appetite, occasional vomiting to systemic inflammatory response syndrome, multi-organ dysfunction syndrome and shock.
so it can go into a sim a simple uh, you know dehydration and uh, you know gastritis into a very serious problem of shock and multi organ failure so it can happen like that breed predilection any breed can be affected but several breeds are predisposed schnauzers yorkshire terriers spaniels boxers shetland sheep dogs coolies are over represented this is the reason probably we don't get to see more uh, acute pancreatitis in india and whether genetic mutation of certain protease inhibitors in schnauzers is contributing to the development of pancreatitis has not been disseminated but has been hypothesized in case of schnauzers they think that these enterocytes which elaborate uh, enterokinase is lacking so that might be the reason for activation of these enzymes when they are in the pancreas that may be pre, uh, breed predilection age and race typically affected middle east or to older patients that may be overweight or have a history of dietary discretion so the inciting cause of pancreatitis in the dog is usually unknown so always we say 50 more than 50% of the times we say it is idiopathic so the mostly we say it is idiopathic because the cause is not known so nutrition plays a vital role i told you already obese pets are um, vulnerable to um, pancreatic disease plus dietary indiscretion high fat content then hypertriglyceridemia and hereditary factors play a uh, big role there are certain breeds of dogs which has hypertriglyceridemia this is seen in human beings where there is hypertriglyceridemia is a hereditary disease similarly seen also in schnauzers we see hypertriglyceridemia in certain breeds uh, in uh, dogs so it can uh, play a vital role in being the cause for acute pancreatitis drugs are the most important drugs and toxins are the most important when you uh, uh, come to drugs we should definitely know what are the drugs which we commonly use which can cause uh, pancreatitis l aspergillus that can cause uh, severe um, uh, pancreatitis azathioprine which you use in you know atopy and cases it that immunosuppressed uh, you know suppressive dr drugs can cause uh, acute pancreatitis furosemide estrogen uh, potassium bromide which you use as anti epileptic drug and um, sulfonamides tetracyclines steroids is a big question mark sometimes steroids are used to treat pancreatitis and sometimes steroids are thought to create pancreatitis but nevertheless now they have proven that steroids have got nothing to do with pancreatitis so but anyway there is anecdotal reports are there insecticides scorpion stings are very very commonly uh, uh, reported to cause severe pancreatitis and in fact a scorpion uh, venom is the one which is used as an experimental model to cause pancreatitis in dogs okay zinc is another um, uh, toxin which uh, uh, should be thought about castor beans hypercalcemia and whatever reason tumors hypercalcemia can cause severe uh, pancreatitis so duct obstruction duct obstruction uh, obstruction can uh, take place in different ways it can be a tumor in the gi system which can ob obstruct the you know um, pancreatic duct or it may be a pancreatic duct a fluke or it may be a, you know surgical um, uh, effect which um, uh, in the inflamed um, mucosa of the duodenum closes the pancreatic duct so all these things can cause duct ob obstruction and cause acute pancreatitis and duodenal and biliary reflex usually seen as a sequelae of surgeries and pancreatic trauma and pancreatic ischemia which is again a very important reason result of hypotension from fluid loss or anesthesia and reperfusion hypotension shock uh, surgery where there is venous occlusion all this thing can cause you know uh, severe um, pancreatic ischemia and uh, lead on to Uh, uh you know um, pancreatitis the inciting cause may be as i told you start with apart from all these things listed it can be also uh, idiopathic and most important in our uh, indian swine we should always suspect pancreatitis when you have uh, babesia canis or ehrlichia canis which can cause a potential cause of um, uh, you know uh, pancreatitis most often hypothesized reason for this is the clot formation thrombus formation which occludes the blood vessels 
leading on to ischemia of the pancreas. That is the most important reason because it's, you know clot formation is the biggest problem in Babesia or Ehrlichia where there's a bleeding tendency. What are the clinical signs of uh, you know uh, pancreatitis? Very simple. They are brought with a um, history of vomiting, and when you see the clinical sign, they are dehydrated. They have nausea, hypersalivation, abdominal pain is relieved most of the patients. In uh, human beings, abdominal pain is a cardinal sign of uh, you know pancreatic problem. Whereas 50% uh, of our pet population hide the pain because the pain tolerance in pets are much more than human beings. They are able to uh, hide the pain, abdominal pain. Petechiae and ecchymosis because it's a bleeding disorder. I told you, kinins um, completely affect the blood vessels and they become leaky. So petechiae and ecchymosis on the abdomen it can be very uh, important uh, clinical signs. Labored breathing, acute respiratory syndrome because of the change in surfactant of the um, uh, lungs as well as because of um, this um, clotting mechanism which can affect the uh, ischemia of the lungs and cause severe labored breathing. So, uh, almost uh, all, always this is a praying posture is pathognomonic for severe abdominal pain and is most often seen in pancreatic disease. So the four limbs are stretched, the sternum is pressed on the ground, the elevated hindquarters to relieve abdominal anterior quarter abdominal pain. This is a posture called praying posture, which is very, very uh, significant in case of pancreatitis. Then physical examination. So pain on abdominal palpation. See, even if the animal doesn't uh, evince pain, uh, like, you know, the praying posture, most of the animals while abdominal palpation, they induce vomiting or nausea. They start retching when you start palpating the abdomen because of the mild pain it is showing. Then many cases you have anterior abdominal mass because you know you have cyst or you have a hematomas on the pancreas or peritonitis. You have an anterior abdominal mass when you are palpating. Tachycardia or bradycardia, I told you, tachycardia or bradycardia is always as a sequelae to all diseases which goes into SIRS and MODS. They will go into compensatory tachycardia and they are going to uncompensated bradycardia at the end. So whether you see tachycardia or whether you see bradycardia, you should know that it is an acutely ill pancreatitis case. A rapid or delayed CRT. When there is, uh, you know, rapid perfusion of the uh, mucous membrane's uh, color, that means again it is a uh, sign of uh, increased heart rate and increased. There's a, uh, you know, a lot of inflammatory mediators are doing this job. And delayed CRT is uh, always suggestive of shock. Ascites, as I told you, it causes hemorrhage in the uh, uh, pancreas and it can cause um, uh, accumulation of fluids in the abdominal cavity as ascites. So what are the laboratory findings? Not very uh, pathognomonic. So usually you have elevated PCV from dehydration, inflammatory leukogram, always you see inflammatory leukogram. You see thrombocytopenia. These are the main uh, hematological uh, evidence you can get uh, find. So the thrombocytopenia is because the blood vessels are leaky and the thrombocytes are used to pluck these uh, leaky blood vessels and therefore now these the number of thrombocytes come down. So it is also a, a figure which you should know, which you should think that it is going in for critical case. When you see the serum biochemistry, serum profile abnormalities may include mild to moderate elevation of cholestatic enzymes or hepatocellular enzymes. What is cholestatic enzyme? Which already we have seen in the previous uh, lecture. All your serum alkaline phosphatase and your bilirubin they are all going to be increased and your ALT will be increased definitely. Maybe AST is not increased. Okay, So if you do ALT and AST, ALT will be increased, AST, uh, alkaline phosphatase will be increased, bilirubin will be increased. Okay, And when you see the electrolytes, it definitely shows all abnormalities which is encountered with severe dehydration and loss of chlorides due to vomiting like hypochloremia, hypokalemic, metabolic alkalosis. So this is always a must. You should all remember 
the treatment of um, um, acute pancreatitis always involves fluid therapy with special reference to potassium supplementation because it causes severe hypokalemia. And hypokalemia in turn uh, uh, creates uh, gastric uh, atoning and it's a sequelae of event happening. So potassium, I mean, um, uh, you have to uh, give potassium uh, when you are treating with uh, fluids. Acetemia. Acetemia be, can be present in most commonly associated with the pre-renal rehydration. I told you already, when you are seeing uh, acetemia in case of uh, pancreatitis, it is okay. But if you uh, if you think it's a uh, pre-renal acetemia because of dehydration, is it okay? But if, when you correct the fluid therapy, if you correct the fluid therapy and again look for uh, burn and creatine, if it, if it is increased, that means it has gone in for permanently damaging the kidneys leading on to chronic kidney disease. So you should be very, very carefully uh, looking at uh, the burn and creatinine after fluid therapy to see whether the kidneys have been damaged endlessly. Okay, that is very important. Hypoalbuminemia will be seen in case of biochemistry because there is loss of protein uh, because of leaky blood vessels uh, as also due to uh, directly uh, extravasation of um, protein from the pancreas, you find hypoalbuminemia. Okay, and lipase and amylase, I have, you can see for lipase and amylase, but they have very poor sensitivity and specificity. So they are no more used to diagnose, uh, you know, pancreatic disease. In fact, uh, amylase and uh, uh, lipase, they can be used to uh, diagnose chronic kidney disease because they both are, uh, you know, uh, excreted by the kidney. In case they are uh, retained and their values are increased, that means kidney is unable to do the function, so it's a chronic kidney disease. Only for that lipase and amylase can be used, not for diagnosing acute pancreatitis. Commercial laboratory, uh, you know, um, uh, and you know, you have a canine pancreas specific uh, lipase. That can be really a wonderful uh, test, uh, which has got 82% uh, uh, sensitivity and specificity of 96%. Okay, canine specific pancreatic lipase. So you should not go into human, uh, you know, a diagnosis of pancreatitis because this is protein sensitive. So canine specific pancreatic lipase uh, demonstration, uh, serum demonstration, which will be highly sensitive. Okay, the sensitive or other diagnostic testing is much lower. Trypsin-like immunoreactivity has a sensitive uh, sensitivity of 36 to 47 percent. Trypsin-like immunoreactivity is an excellent diagnostic uh, uh, method for uh, diagnosing exocrine pancreatic insufficiency, but not pancreatitis. Okay, abdominal ultrasonography is only got 68% efficacy, specificity and sensitivity in diagnosing because it's very, very um, tricky, uh, only, uh, you know, very uh, uh, skillful ultrasonologists can diagnose. And even them, uh, only 60% of sensitivity and specificity is there for diagnostic criteria. So assess for uh, pancreatic lipase immunoreactivity, um, determine the serum concentrated lipase that originates from SNR cells of the exocrine pancreas, assess that me measure PLA or species specific, I told you. So you should use canine specific, um, you know, pancreatic lipase and feline specific pancreatic lipase to diagnose acute pancreatitis in uh, dogs and acute pancreatitis in uh, cats separately with separate, uh, um, you know, assay method, separate protein. You have a SNAP a CPL, uh, which is all, uh, you know, um, uh, per patient side test for use in dogs, which is now becoming common in veterinary practice. This is very good. So this has got um, good uh, sensitivity and specificity. Once you see a positivity in this, then you can go for, uh, you know, um, uh, pancreatic uh, lipase um, immunoreactivity. That can be done. So this can be a bedside diagnosis, which can give you a reference range of less than 2 megagram uh, is per liter is uh, negative, questionable range 200 to 400 gram micrograms per liter, and diagnostic cutoff of pancreatitis is more than 400 microgram per liter. The SNAP CPL is positive, then you can go for canine um, uh, pancreas specific lipase, uh, which will fall in questionable diagnostic range. 
So I told you abdominal radiographic findings are not very pathognomonic, but they nevertheless they give you a lot of uh, clues to suspect uh, you know uh, acute pancreatitis. Um, you know it can result in changes visible in survey abdominal radiographs, uh, loss of abdominal details primarily in the right cranial abdomen due to focal peritonitis, mass effect in the right cranial abdomen, displacement of the pylorus cranially or to the left. Ventral or right-sided displacement of the descending duodenum, caudal displacement of the transverse colon, bowel lobes adjacent to the pancreas may be gas-filled, ileus, or corrugated, spastic in appearance. These are all, uh, yeah, you know, uh, the uh, some of the um, uh, findings you find in radiology. The lateral abdominal radiograph of a dog with pancreatitis. There is a mass effect on the cranial abdomen caudal to the stomach as well as a ventral displacement of the gas filled descending duodenum can be seen in this picture. Abdominal ultrasound is definitely by far a better diagnostic but still nevertheless I told you it has got a specificity and sensitivity of 68 percent that means you can fail 32 percent of the times to diagnose pancreatitis that means you can get false positive or false negative during your uh, abdominal ultrasound uh, diagnosis. Okay, so the right limb between the right kidney and the duodenum, this is the uh, window and body between the pylorus and the portal vein. So you will have to look for the right kidney, the duodenum, the portal vein and the greater curvature of the stomach. With this mark, if you go in to find uh, the ultra, ultrasound of the pancreas at, at the 8.5 megahertz, uh, you will be able to definitely see them. So you can see the cross-sectional image of the uh, duodenum. Uh, the right limb of the pancreas is located dorsal and medial to the duodenum. Just below the you know, duodenum, you can see the pancreas. It is uh, slightly hypoechoic to surrounding tissue. Sometimes you may also have hyperechoic uh, you know, borders. That means you, are, you may have both uh, hypoechoic uh, because of you know, bleeding tendency and hyperechoic because of fibrosis. Both can be seen when you are, so you should be very skillful in, uh, you know, reading the results of uh, ultrasound. So you can also see the longitudinal view of the ascending duodenum. The right limb of the pancreas noted dorsal to the duodenum and uh, the pancre pancreato duodenal vein is an anechoic tubular structure parallel to the duodenum. So you'll be able to appreciate the longitudinal section of the duodenum. You can see uh, the anechoic tubular structure of the vein and you can also see the uh, slightly hyperechoic uh, you know, uh, pancreas dorsal to the uh, vein. So ultrasound image of the left pancreatic limb in a cat. So caliper 1 is the one which shows you the thickness of the pancreas. So you can see a slightly hypoechoic uh, pancreas. In the middle of the pancreas, you can see the pancreatic duct, which is also measured by the calipers. So you can see the duct, you can see the pancreas. So this is how, and the top above that, uh, similar echo, that is a spleen. So you can see a longitudinal ultrasound image of left pancreatic limb of a cat with pancreatitis. Pancreas is thickened, very much thickened, and uh, more than 2 point centimeter between the calipers hypoechoic and irregular with a scallop border. These are all highly suggestive of pancreatitis. Similarly, you can see the um, duct inside in the between, in between the pancreas, middle of the pancreas, and again, the enlarged pancreas and the hypoechoic, same. And sometimes uh, you find uh, pancreas with the hyperechoic also, I told you, fibrosis, Okay, this is a fibrosed uh, pancreas. This is a um, uh, really more than uh, 60 to 70 percent of the pancreas already fibrosed. And the most important thing uh, is uh, you will have to um, score the system, whether you know it's a mild, a moderate, or severe. Uh, okay, so that you can know the prognosis. If the score is zero, it's got an excellent prognosis. If it's moderate, it's got good to fair. If it is the score is two, it is fat to poor. Severe three to four, poor or grave prognosis. So, what are the clinical presentation to classify these things? So, the zero where there's a mild, um, 
often resolves spontaneously. Recovery is uncomplicated, managed as an outpatient. If hydration status is very good. Intra fluid, intravenous fluids can be given if necessary. Pancreatic rest or pain control is usually all that is required. You find there is a mild case where it has vomition. You give only a painkiller, uh, hydromorphone or butrophenol. A, any uh, painkiller you can give. And if it is dehydrated, which is seen from skin turgor, but dehydrated, give fluids. Otherwise, it becomes normal. Give some rest. Um, give uh, a normal, uh, you know, a GI, uh, you know, um, diet, which is uh, less in protein, less in fat. That will give rest to the pancreas. And good to fair, usually dehydrated. The renal system is most often compromised. There is renal, pre-renal failure. Treatment involves administration of crystalloids at the twice the maintenance rate together with electrolytes. Nil paros, you usually don't give anything. See, this is a very controversial subject. Most of us, we always say, when the animal is vomiting, nil per uh, os, and so that, you know, uh, till it becomes all right, don't give anything orally. But that is being disproved time and again. So they always say the enterocytes require fuel for it to do its function. So the earliest opportunity you get, you should go for nutrition, enteral nutrition, that is most important. Okay, uh, recovery is usually uncomplicated, for it, adequate fluid therapy is given. If anorexia lasts for more than two days, then consider additional nutrition support by way of, uh, you know, tubes. Fat to poor uh, prognosis, the score is two, dehydrated, hypovolemic, often pre-renal failure, degenerative uh, left shift leukocytosis. Animals usually recover with intensive therapy, but may have to be euthanized for financial reasons. Intravenous crystalloids, uh, administered as per treatment for shock, followed by colloids with or without plasma in many cases, monitor urine output, renal function, lung sounds, control pain, and uh, consider special nutrition support, monitor uh, coagulation status carefully, and intervene early with fresh frozen plasma and aparin if necessary. You may need referral if there is a poor response to initial therapy. So whenever the animal is dehydrated, or hypovolemic, or uh, there is a pre-renal failure, you try and you are going to give uh, crystalloids. Crystalloids, and if it is not satisfying and the parameters are not coming back to normalcy, then you give, uh, uh, you know, uh, aggressive fluid therapy with crystalloids and colloids. And always make sure that the bladder is forming urine. So either you catheter the bladder and see if the urine formation is there, or at least palpate and find if there is urine formation in the bladder. That is effective to say that there is a uh, renal function going on. So, of course, pain uh, control is there. So, you usually have to look for uh, bleeding tendencies like a platelet count. And in case you want to do it, you can also do it all coagulation parameters like PTT, APTT, all these things can be done. And you can also do, um, you know, diam D diamers if you think there is going to be acute respiratory dis uh, distress syndrome or there is going to be uh, chronic kidney injury. You can also do, uh, you know, um, uh, look for dimers, D dimers. Okay, all this thing can be seen, and the prognosis is fair to poor. And uh, when when the uh, score is three to four, uh, the prognosis is grave. Extensive therapy and life support is required with constant monitoring. Early referral is advised. Surgical intervention and peritoneal lavage may be necessary. Veterinary support, central venous pressure monitoring, high volume fluid therapy is usually needed. Genostomy feeding and total parenteral uh, nutrition can are often required. Most uh, most patients die or they are euthanized. So when you have a very serious case, then you know you need to think about uh, when it's not responding to your fluid the aggressive fluid therapy, then you have to think about uh, surgical exploration where there can be a block in the uh, pancreatic duct. Okay, that can be relieved. So, or you can always give lavage because there is peritonitis. You can give a gastric lavage, pancreatic lavage can be given so that and also that it can avoid sepsis. So, these are all the things which you can try uh, in the when, when it, the case is very uh, uh, grave prognosis is there. So, most important is aggressive therapy, monitoring, and uh, looking for parameters uh, for you know. Um, Plotting parameters, all these things are very, very important. 
so what what actually you do what is the algorithm for this so when the animal is brought to you uh, with uh, vomiting or acute abdominal pain you take the signal bent age and a breed uh, specific you know the breed specific is there you suspect more then you take the history there is going to be history of indiscriminate feeding awful feedings or leftover feeding and all the things there then you do physical examination there are mild clinical signs treat them and uh, with the supportive therapy if they are going to be systemically ill then do your cbc biochemistry and urine analysis once you do this cbc and uh, biochemistry and urine analysis you will know it has got a renal problem or a hepatic problem or a endocrine problem if you find any abnormal uh, reading in renal hepatic or endocrine you further go in for diagnosis and treat them accordingly if there are no biochemical changes then you do radiography okay uh, to rule out any surgical conditions surgical disease okay if there are no evidence of surgical disease then you do exploratory surgery okay? and there are no uh, findings in your exploratory surgery or uh, uh, in your um, uh, radiology then go for ultrasound and snap test okay and snap test if it is a normal pancreas in your ultrasound and normal serum uh, sample for a snap test then supportive care and uh, reevaluate it if it has got a normal pancreas in ultrasound but abnormal serum as say for your uh, snap test then it is pancreas or treated as pancreatitis you have a abnormal pancreas in the ultrasound and you have a normal serum then also you will uh, treat it as a pancreatitis so it's very very clear whenever a case comes you have to do a basic uh, history taking all those things then you do a basic cbc biochemistry rule out all uh, renal hepatic and all and then go in for radiology if radiology see for any uh, uh, radiological i mean uh, surgical induced uh, problems are there so history also will tell you there are no some such signs go for ultrasound and uh, snap test okay you do a snap test then uh, based on the snap test and ultrasound you find out if it is going to be normal uh, ultrasound and normal snap test just normally treat them if it is going to have abnormal uh, ultrasound or abnormal snap test treat them as uh, acute pancreatitis so now the treatment is, is either inpatient or outpatient as i told you how once you have graded them as uh, 0 1 and 2 3 to 4 like that then you decide how it for uh, in, initially you can treat them as outpatient okay just uh, provide uh, supportive care you just give a diet which is uh, non irritant to the gi system then give a pain control and send them if it is uh, requiring uh, electrolytes you know, put them on uh, uh, crystallites like ringer's lactate okay of course uh, the, you know about the uh, you know kirby's rule of 20 we have already seen in uh, Uh, you know um, uh, in uh, critical care all those uh, thing you allow to think okay like uh, you know uh, fluid balance colloidal osmotic pressure uh, then uh, you know oxygenation and ventilation um, blood pressure heart rate glucose body temperature albumin all these things have to be monitored once you know that there is a emergency if the patient is emergent the rule of kirby and all these things have to be seen so that you don't miss out a uh, yeah, yeah, valiant uh, point where you can interfere so most important thing is intravenous fluid therapy which is most important in acute pancreatitis there are no specific uh, you know uh, drugs where you give you have to give uh, fluid therapy okay and reverse the dehydration address electrolyte imbalances associated with vomiting fluid pooling in the hypomotile gastrointestinal tract maintain adequate pancreatic circulation i told you ischemia shock will go in for uh, pancreatic ischemia and that will again more cause more injury to the pancreas so we should not uh, lead the animal into a condition where uh, there is going to be a severe uh, fluid abnormality which uh, leads on to shock and uh, ischemia of the pancreas so we have to treat with uh, aggressive fluid therapy so fluid therapy is vital to reduce uh, re- uh, when there is reduced perfusion pancreatic ischemia and uh, the pancreatic necrotize uh, necrotization so mostly it is uh, ringer's lactate okay the most important is ringer's lactate we have seen fluid therapy how it is given 
in a critically ill patient. So Ringer's lactate is the one which uh, is a uh, one which um, replaces interstitial uh, fluid loss, that is dehydration. Okay. If there is going to be shock, then you will have to add uh, colloids. That means you want to replace fluid at the uh, vascular side. You want fluids in the vascular system, so you want to add uh, colloids. So it's very important that you treat with crystalloids and uh, colloids based on the clinical signs. If it is simple dehydration, treat them with crystalloids. If it is going to be severely dehydrated to show pre-renal acidemia, treat with 90 ml per kg of crystalloids. If there is going to be a, a, you know, incidence where there is going to be shock or a sepsis or a SERS disease, then you include uh, you know, uh, half the uh, uh, crystalloids and compensate it with colloids so that you can prevent the animal going in for shock. Okay. So always is important to measure urine output because there should not be, you know, the, the, you know the pathway of uh, shock. So first the system uh, stops the blood perfusion to the skin. Then next uh, blood perfusion is stopped to the intestines. Then it stops to the kidney where there is no more urine production. So the shock is left unabated without interfering. It will go into uh, almost multi-organ failure. So to know whether it is affecting the kidney or not, you will have to measure the urine. You have seen in human beings, always whenever there is a critically ill patient, they always catheterize uh, bladder and find, find out the function of the bladder. Similarly, here also, it's high time. I have seen now practices, most of the very good practices in India, veterinary practices, they always catheterize and look for uh, the production of uh, urine and urine examination, okay, specific gravity and things like that. It gives you a lot of ideas, okay. So it's very important to uh, measure the urine output. So rapid crystalloid infusion, uh, you know, um, in severely affected animals which have a pathological increase in vascular permeability, uh, carries on increased risk of fluid. So whenever you have uh, vascular permeability increases there, I told you, the pathogenesis of um, um, pancreatitis, the kinin destroys the blood vessels and they become leaky. So acute pancreatitis is a, a SERS disease. So when you give crystalloids rapidly, you have to always be careful that it doesn't cause severe lung edema. So that we are, you have to keep auscultating the lungs and if there's going to be a lung edema and if you are able to find there is a lot of fluid in the wet lung, you'll be able to auscultate and find out. If that is there, you'll have to use uh, furosemide, okay? Uh, such cases should therefore be monitored carefully, preferably have their central venous pressure measured. If you are having a central vein, then you can also measure the CVP. I already told you about the potassium supplementation, which is uh, required. So a dog with severe hypokalemia will not only develop skeletal muscle weakness, but also GI attorney, which will contribute to the clinical signs of the disease and delay successful feeding. So most total body potassium is intracellular, so there is significant total body potassium depletion by the time there is measurable plasma hypokalemia. So whenever there is hypokalemia and you are able to uh, quantify um, the potassium in the blood, then you can replace, you know, there is a Hartman solution which is called potassium or you can use potassium chloride or potassium bromide, sorry, potassium chloride uh, in addition to Ringer's lactate, okay. So Ringer's lactate is a mainstay as um, you know uh, intercellular uh, fluid for uh, treating dehydration and causing a fluid balance. Okay, it has got the sodium chloride, lactate, potassium ion, calcium ion, osmolality similar to plasma. The plasma transfusion may be life-saving in severe cases. Uh, in a very bad case, when the prognosis is very unfavorable, then you can give plasma transfusion because it replaces alpha-1 antitrypsin and alpha-2 macroglobulin, which is uh, against the trypsin getting activated. Those, those will uh, safeguard the uh, trypsin becoming activated. So you can give a plasma. It also supplies clotting factors. You know, it's a bleeding blood vessels. So the, there is going to be a severe uh, thrombocytopenia. The plasma also contributes uh, towards, uh, you know, um, platelets. And of course, whenever you give um, for a um, SERS disease, whenever you think of giving for a bleeding problem, 
you also think about plotting problem. So wherever you think there could be a plotting problem, you will have to use a pattern because there is going to be disseminated intravascular coagulation because the, the whole fibrinolysis in the cascade is affected because of the kinin pathway. Therefore, it can go into uh, severe renal failure because of, uh, you know, uh, clot formation in the renal uh, blood cells or it can go into acute respiratory dis uh, distress syndrome because of block of uh, respiratory blood cells. So you have to use carefully uh, heparin. So how to use uh, both the plasma as well as heparin? One side you are treating bleeding, the other side you are uh, treating clotting. How to balance this? That is by virtue of doing your uh, clotting uh, parameters, PTT, APTT and D dimers, you will be able to select which is better for uh, which, uh, which is, you know, case based. You don't know which, which case goes into, uh, you know, uh, clot formation, which grows into bleeding formation. So based on these tests, you will be able to find out whether to go for uh, only plasma replacement or plasma with apparel. Nutrition supplementation is paramount to recovery. Little evidence supports outdated therapies involving no oral food uh, or water in patients with pancreatitis. Even in paroviral entities, nowadays, you know, we say that uh, we should start uh, feeding. Once we are able to control vomiting, immediately start feeding them. That is the most important for enterocytes to turn around into uh, start producing their own enzymes. Okay. So villus atrophy occurs when the animal doesn't eat for more than two days. So it's very important. Easy to place tubes, esophagostomy tubes are well tolerated. Nasogastric tubes can be very easily done and uh, all practicing veterinarians can do this. Trickle feeding, again, uh, it bypasses cephalic, gastric and intestinal phase of pancreatic secretion, which requires a uh, peg. Uh, where you know endoscopic uh, peg where you put a tube and pass the stomach and pass the duodenum and uh, give uh, enteral nutrition. So the nasal gastric tube sutured in the, to the nasal uh, filtrum uh, and to the skin ventral to the zygomatic arch. So this is very important uh, you know in two ways. It can uh, be used to aspirate fluid in the stomach so that there is no nausea in the dog and there is no, not going to be vomiting and loss of chlorides. One, there will not be aspiration pneumonia. And also you can use them for feeding. All purpose will be uh, served with this nasogastric tube in place. So just to find out how bad it is. anti ulcer uh, therapy is again important. Patients with acute pancreatitis have increased risk of gastroduodenal ulceration due to local peritonitis and should therefore be monitored carefully for evidence of melina or hematemesis. Okay, Sucralfate is an excellent drug. S2 blockers can be used, pantoprazole or omeprazole, uh, femotidin, simetidin. Of course, simetidin uh, you should be very uh, carefully used because if the hepatic system is also affected, then you, you cannot use simetidin because it affects uh, cytochrome P450. So as I already told you, whenever you are seeing this, this is called triaditis, pancreas, small intestine and liver getting affected is called triaditis. So whenever there is a, you know, inflammatory bowel disease, there will be, a, you know, there will be pancreatitis, there will be hepatic uh, problem, polycystic problem. So you always should uh, think about these three organs. While you are, uh, so cimetidin need not be used in case uh, you suspect uh, liver involvement. Ranitidin can be used instead. Of course, um, if there's going to be uh, uh, excess vomiting by using um, ranitidin because it's got also prokinetic, then you can stop that. Anti-emetics, metoclopramide uh, can be very useful, but also it, it, uh, it promotes gastric motility. It might cause pain. In either of the case, if there is there, you can discontinue metoclopramide and go for maropetone or uh, dolcetron or andensetron. All these things can be uh, tried uh, because they don't have pro-motility uh, 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 no function. So, of course, you can use uh, chlorpromazine. You can use, uh, you know, uh, this also is also provides analgesia as well as an anti-mectic effect. 
So some of the common drugs used during pancreatitis, clopromazine, it's got antiemetic and sedative effect, uh, dolacetron, antiemetic, fentanyl, analgesic, hydromorphone, analgesic, ketamine, analgesic, lidocaine, analgesic, maropitan is an excellent antiemetic without a promotility problem, the methadone, analgesic, metoclopromide, antiemetic as well as propanetic, condensetron, antiemetic. So these are all the drugs commonly used. This you can have as a cutout in case of, you know, all your critically ill patients. The same is a case for uh, all critically ill patients. You know, all these critically ill patients, there'll be mucosal turnover will be less. So there'll be ulcers, there'll be hematomases, there'll be say, melina. So always these drugs should be used very carefully with the dust, you know, dose and things like that, or as a CRI, you can use them. Analgesic therapy may improve appetite, ventilatory capacity, and mobility. Opioid analgesics, fentanyl, methadone, hydromorphone may help resolve abdominal pain. Infusions of ketamine and lidocaine in local therapies, example, epidural, may be used to treat pain. NSAIDs in steroids may exacerbate GI ulceration, should not be used. They also cause renal injury and pancreatitis. So, NSAIDs and steroids can be avoided in acute pancreatitis. Antibiotics uh, are usually not required, but um, there might be complications where there's going to be a leukocytosis and there's going to be uh, infection. Uh, so you can always use endofloxacin is excellent uh, drug. Trimethoprim sulfadiazine, of course, trimethoprim sulfadiazine has got heterodoxic uh, potential, so you don't use uh, trimethoprim sulfadiazine. Endofloxacin is excellent. Of course, you'll have to use metanidazole also uh, for anaerobic organisms. So it also, metronidazole is useful for inflammatory bowel disease or small intestinal bacterial overgrowth occurring secondary to intestinal ileus. So you know that when there is going to be a, uh, you know, acute pancreatitis, there's going to be a change of, uh, you know, the um, um, bacterial population is, uh, SI system. Therefore, you can always go in for metronidazole and interfloxacin to reset them. Long-term dietary advice depends on the history and whether there was a single episode or acute pancreatitis or recurrent episodes or chronic pancreatitis. In later case, there's a very little that can be done to prevent recurrence. Maintaining the animal on a long-term low-fat diet such as royal canine, waltham, digestive low-fat diet uh, or uh, chappi, there's another uh, brand with uh, no scavenging on high-fat uh, tidbits or good enough. In some cases, it has been suggested that long-term administration of pancreatic enzymes mixed in the food may reduce the risk of recurrence by a negative feedback effect on pancreatic enzyme uh, releases. Of course, uh, this has to be studied. Pancreatic enzymes are a good choice for exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. In case of acute pancreatitis, so long-term, probably you can mix uh, pancreatic powders. Surgical treatment, as I told you, surgical treatment is done to uh, lavage uh, pancreatic and peritoneal lavage, debridement of necrotic tissue, drainage, partial pancreatectomy, placement of feeding tubes, and also see that there's going to be a lot of adhesions between the, you know, uh, uh, duodenum and the uh, pancreas, you know, you can see, or whether uh, any other uh, previous surgery which is blocking the, uh, you know, uh, pancreatic duct. All these things can be seen when you surgically explore or surgically treat. So these are all uh, surgical exploration of a dog with pancreatic disease. So nodal appearance of the pancreas and the extensive additions of duodenum, which are obscuring the mesentery. So they are uh, so extensive additions, mesenteries are not seen. So with this uh, acute pancreatitis is over. So what is acute pancreatitis? Acute pancreatitis is um, a disease which causes because of activation of trypsin to start with and activation of all other enzymes later when they are in the pancreas itself. It is seen in obese animals when they are fed high fat diet. So the pathogenesis involves uh, you know, uh, a lot of uh, inflammatory mediators which go into SERS disease and multiple organ failure uh, with, uh, you know, bleeding tendencies and uh, tendency to clot. 
So we'll have to monitor them. The mainstay of therapy is uh, pain uh, uh, treatment for acute abdominal pain, fluid therapy, aggressive fluid therapy, either uh, crystalloids and crystalloids alone for hydration or crystalloids and colloids when there is shock. And um, you can also go for a plasma when you think uh, it is a very serious case where you can think uh, you can give factors which are responsible for destruction of uh, trypsin. To all those things, uh, you'll be helpful in giving plasma. It also supplies uh, platelets because it's got a ble uh, you know, leaky blood vessels and you have to think that you have to treat them with uh, heparin or enoxaparin uh, because clot formation will cause uh, acute respiratory syndrome and acute nephrotic syndrome. So you have to do all these things and it is a critically ill disease which you have to manage very aggressively. And next is exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. It's a, a syndrome characterized by the inadequate synthesis and secretion of pancreatic digestive enzyme due to severe damage or lack of pancreatic SNR cells. So either there are no SNR cells or there is a blockade of pancreatic duct or there is an injury to the uh, cells. In all these conditions, uh, the SNR cells do not elaborate enzymes which are required for digestion. Once they are not uh, elaborated, then the, uh, the pancreatic juice does not enter the duodenum to take care of the protein, carbohydrate and fat assimilation. So these, uh, th apart from that, the secretions of the pancreatic also contains antibacterial substances. Okay, they are also will control the uh, flora and fauna of the small intestines. That also is disrupted. So the symbiosis of the small intestinal microflora is completely upset and there can be loss of uh, body weight, a loss of system, there can be uh, a lack of uh, cobalamin, there can be excess of uh, folate, all these problems can ensue and you know the, uh, the problem can exacerbate into even uh, death. So exocrine pancreatic insufficiency is lack of enzymes or lack of enzyme to enter into the duodenum. 50% of the exocrine pancreatic insufficiency is due to acinar atrophy, okay, the pancreatic acinar atrophy and other 50% are due to injuries and other reasons. So patients with an obstructed pancreatic duct or a deficiency in enteropeptidase in the small intestine have the same clinical signs and are thus classified as having EPA. I told you, not only enzyme, even when there is lack of enteropeptidase, which is most important for activation of the enzymes, then also you uh, claim them as EPA. In general, EPA is due to lack of functional pancreatic asana cells, which in turn can be due to asana atrophy or damage to chronic pancreatic inflammation because of chronic pancreatitis. We saw acute pancreatitis, which is culminating into chronic pancreatitis can lead on to exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. Clinical signs are attributed to maldigestion and malabsorption of nutrients and develop after approximately 90% of the secretory capacity of the exocrine pancreas was lost. The system affected is GI system. There is a genetic uh, implication uh, uh, to cause uh, pancreatic acinal atrophy. And this is uh, supposed to be more than 50% of all exocrine pancreatic insufficiency cases. To, to date, they have uh, incriminated only German shepherds and uh, rough coated collies and Eurasians. What is Eurasians? It is a crossbred of Europe and Asian breeds, Eurasians. Only these three breeds are uh, prone to uh, exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. So, um, any canine breed, but German Shepherds, rough quartered collies have a familial predisposition. Typically, young adults, one to two years of age, and uh, chronic pancreatitis uh, leading on to EPA can be middle aged. German Shepherds are younger at the time of diagnosis than dogs of other breeds. There is no sex predilection, both male and female are affected similarly. Idiopathic PA is the most common cause of German shepherds. Even why there is going to be uh, pancreatic acinar atrophy is again idiopathic. 
but most often they have seen anecdotal reference to lymphocytic infiltration. So there was uh, immune mediated pathogenesis involved in the cause of uh, you know uh, pancreatic acinar atrophy. So chronic that is the reason sometimes we treat them with uh, steroids. Chronic pancreatitis can result in destruction of acinar cells. Uh, the breeds which are amenable to chronic pancreatitis are Cavalier King Charles Spaniels and Jack Russell Terriers are predisposed. Okay. Now, other rare causes might include EPI due to pancreatic duct obstruction, due to tumors or surgery, congenital aplasia or pancreatic hyperplasia. These are all rare uh, occurrences where there is obstruction to the uh, pancreatic uh, flow enzyme flow it can be even flukes or can be a reason or it can be a tumor all this thing can cause a um, block of uh, flow of enzymes which causes exocrine pancreatic insufficiency pathophysiology of exocrine pancreatic insufficiency the loss of pancreatic acinar cell leads to a lack of digestive enzyme in the small intestinal lumen leading to impaired nutrient absorption transport resulting in loose voluminous tools and weight loss Undigested luminal foodstuff may op, uh, alter the intestinal microbiota, data, which may lead to dysbiosis. I, I told you, they also create um, mismanagement of the microbial population, which exists in the uh, small intestines. GI mucosal uh, tropic factors, regulatory peptides, and intrinsic factors are also deficient in pancreatic secretions, leading to changes in the small intestinal mucosal function microanatomy. So therefore, it is not only the problem of pancreas, these um, uh, enzymes are also recovered, uh, required for normal gut health. So when uh, pancreatic enzymes are not there, even small intestinal gut health is going to have a setback and there's going to be a total malabsorption and you know malnutrition. So generalized malnutrition might uh, further affect a GI mucosa. Diabetes mellitus due to loss of islet cells has been reported in patients with EPI. Secondary to chronic pancreatitis, but does not occur in patients with PAE. So you have in chronic pancreatitis, sometimes you may also have, uh, you know, diabetes. So you have hyperglycemia, you have polyuria, polydipsia, along with voluminous tools, all those things. But in case of uh, pancreatic uh, uh, atrophic, uh, you know, uh, problem, you do not uh, get um, uh, diabetes because they attack only the limb which uh, contains acinar cells, not the islet cells. So what are the clinical signs? Very, very characteristic. Weight loss despite normal or increased appetite. They have enormous appetite, but they don't, they are very poor coat, poor body, uh, swim, uh, uh, they don't pick up, put up fat. And foul smelling loose tools, increased fecal volume with cow patty like consistency. You know, like how uh, cows uh, drop dung and splattered. Similar consistency, fecal matter is seen and uh, very foul smelling. Sometimes gl uh, it glistens, it shines because of fat droplets, because fat is not digested. Fat droplets can be seen in the fecal matter. So it just looks shining. So, uh, increased number of defecation, usually more than three uh, per day. And most important thing, you find coprophagia, very, very common in German shepherds, coprophagia, or even pica. You have flatulence, barbaric mess. So, whenever you see such cases, you also have to treat them with pancreatic enzymes. And you also have to think about pancreatic uh, uh, efficiency, okay? Um, exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. Of course, there are not uh, many incidences where there is vomiting. Polyuria, polydipsia, there is going to be concurrent uh, uh, diabetes. Nervousness and aggressions, you also see. That is because of uh, poor, uh, you know, um, uh, body condition. And, you know, because of that, it has got aggression. So, the physical examination, you have poor body condition and muscle wasting, poor quality hair. In general, history and clinical signs can help uh, raise suspicion that EPI may be present. So very clear, it's going to be uh, mostly a German Shepherd or a Coolies or other breeds which are uh, predisposed to uh, pancreatic acinar uh, cell atrophy 
all those breeds and when they are presented to you with uh, you know not putting on weight poor condition and uh, frequently uh, passing foul smelling uh, you know um, uh, loose motions then you always have a diagnosis right that is exocrine pancreatic insufficiency so definitive di diagnosis canine trypsin like immuno reactivity as i told you canine trypsin like immuno reactivity is absolutely no good for acute pancreatitis but for uh, exocrine pancreatic insufficiency it is an excellent test uh, this spe species specific test is used to quantify trypsinogen and trypsin in the serum yeah uh, you know uh, trypsin like immuno reactivity less than 2.5 mg per liter after withholding food for more than 8 hours is considered confirmatory for uh, exocrine pancreatic insufficiency if it falls between 2.5 to 5.7 mg may be associated with occult epi serum tli should be retested in 1 to 2 months decrease tli concentration highly sensitive and specific for epi and is not affected by enzyme supplementation Typical elastase. This enzyme-linked uh, immunoabsorbent assay, ELISA, has high sensitivity but low specificity, so it can give false uh, positives. A value of more than 20 microgram helps to eliminate EPI. Values less than 10 microgram will require confirmation with, uh, you know, TLI, trypsin-like immunoreactivity. So differential diagnosis: primary or secondary cause of chronic small bowel diarrhea. Disorders, disorders associated with weight loss, systemic conditions, diabetes mellitus, hepatic failure, malignancies, and many other, and many others. Wherever they can, you think they can be wasting, that can be included as differential diagnosis. But but the characteristic, um, you know, malabsorption and you know, foul smelling diarrhea is uh, good enough to diagnose uh, exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. Uh, laboratory findings not much very unremarkable as i told you always there can be uh, increase in uh, alanine amino transferase aspartate amino transferase alkaline phosphatase activities can be increased in some patients these are all to do with you know um, uh, because they are all related so they can have mild uh, elevations hyperglycemia in seen when there is concurrent um, diabetes serum folate concentrations may be increased serum cobalamin concentration decreased in more than 80% of patients so this is very diagnostic serum cobalamin which i have seen already in, when we are dealt with the malabsorption so serum cobalamin uh, is uh, you know um, uh, very much decreased in case of exocrine pancreatic insufficiency treatment outpatient medical management should be directed towards replacement of pancreatic digestive enzymes Cobalamin supplementation whenever necessary. Inpatient is required when it has got concurrent diabetes, where you have to give insulin and dose, uh, you know, you have to modulate. So it requires um, um, uh, inpatient. Otherwise, it can be uh, outpatient treated. So treatment of choice choice is um, uh, digestive enzymes, powdered pancreatic enzyme, which give one teaspoon per 10 kg body weight. Uh, with each meal mixed into food immediately before feeding, and uh, after a complete response, this dose can usually be significantly decreased. Okay, pre-incubation with uh, enzymes, of, you know, with uh, bile and uh, antacids are not required, which have been done but not required. Enzyme activity, you should understand that enzyme activity may be poor in the product which you buy, or may become poor as on storage in the container itself. So, so whenever the animal is not responding, you need to see that you are using a product which is really good. That is very very important because the lipase, the amount of lipase which is there in your replacement should be enough to uh, uh, alter the uh, normal uh, extrapancreatic insufficiency. There are several uh, products available in the market, most of them. And cobalamin should be supplemented. If the cobalamin is uh, uh, deficient, okay, usually given by subcutaneous injection. Dose is 250 to 1200 milligrams per injection. Cats you give 250 milligrams. Dogs you give about 
250 to 100 milligrams in dogs. Uh, initially given once a week for six weeks, every uh, one, weekly once for six weeks, then one more dose for 30 days uh, later, and serum coagulant constantly is rechecked 30 days after that, and then later on you can give if it is less. So this is a rough, uh, you know, thing where you can give less than 5 kg, 205 microgram uh, for subcutaneously give uh, cyanocobalamin. Uh, 5 to 15 kg, you give 500 micrograms. And first one to six weeks, give once a week for six weeks. Between seven to 12 weeks, you give once every two weeks. Then 16 till 16 weeks, 12 to 16 weeks, one additional injection. Then 20th week, you do recheck the cyanocobalamin, cobalamin concentration. German shepherds have also have uh, prevalence of mesenteric torsion. So you will have to think about mesenteric torsion when it is uh, you know, having a, a surgical uh, complications. Maintenance diets of light main or light maintenance diets fed twice daily usually work well. High or low fat and high fiber diet should be avoided. Alternative therapy than uh, supplementation of uh, this um, pancreatic enzymes, chopped cow, raw cow, mutton, pig or game uh, yeah, pancreas can be kept frozen for months. Of course, there are uh, problems associated with that, like uh, flukes or you know, like uh, disease like uh, uh, spongy form, bovine spongy form, or a juice disease. But nevertheless, they also can be transmitted in powders. So definitely, this is an alternative therapy where you give uh, raw cow, mutton, pig, or game pancreas, and when you store them uh, in the um, uh, freezer, they don't lose their enzyme activity. Of course, nevertheless, they have some other uh, problems which we have to uh, see later. So, antimicrobials, as I already told you, you can, uh, there is a general a small intestinal dysbiosis. So, you can, it can uh, resolve itself. Otherwise, you can go for tylosin for six weeks, uh, twice daily, 25 milligram per kg, twice daily for six weeks or oral oxytetracycline and metanidazole uh, clinical response in some of these patients is not improved. Glucocorticoid therapy, as I told you, is not to be given when there is going to be, um, um, you know, diabetes mellitus. Otherwise, when you think about uh, SNR atrophy, uh, because it is uh, a pre-existing uh, problem is lymphocytic, plasmocytic, gastroenteritis. Sometimes these, uh, those dogs which do not respond to normal, uh, you know, uh, your uh, enzymes, they might respond to glucocorticoid therapy. Antacids uh, reduces gastric pH. Failure to respond to enzyme supplementation will be the result of destruction of the pancreatic lipase in the enzyme supplement by low gastric pH. So that is the reason sometimes your failure can be because of the acid uh, destroying the uh, enzyme uh, powder you are giving, so you can always add uh, antacid. Omeprosol uh, once, uh, once, uh, 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 once, twice daily can be uh, added to the treatment regimen. Coating of entry coated preparations. There are a lot of uh, entry coated uh, tablets and uh, you know uh, capsules which do not uh, have the same uh, efficacy as powder. So it's better to go for uh, uh, powder. So rapid weight gain is expected, but body weight may fail to normalize despite remission of clinical signs. Diarrhea results in two to seven days in uncomplicated cases while you are giving uh, replacement uh, therapy in the form of enzymes. Of course, other uh, less um, uh, encountered diseases, desires are exocrine pancreatic neoplasia, adenocarcinoma. Okay. Uh, when you think about adenocarcinoma, I should you know about uh, Apple's uh, CEO uh, who got adenocarcinoma, most uh, deadly uh, disease, very rare disease in humans, uh, also rare in dogs, but adenocarcinomas, you should always think. Uh, pancreatic sarcomas, lymphosarcomas also been reported. Then pancreatic parasites sometimes, e uh, procyanosis, uh, of course, um, it's a fluke of cats, 
uh, it can be um, diagnosed because of these uh, specific uh, decrocoiled eggs, which you see uh, in the fecal flotation. Fenbendazole, the dose of 30 milligram per kg, uh, once daily for six continuous days, will eradicate these flukes. Well, you can have hepatic flus, again, uh, where you say, see diagnosed by fecal flotation with a single operculum, brown eggs are seen, which is very characteristic of this uh, hepatic flukes. And they are uh, amenable with uh, prasicantol at 40 milligram per kg, once daily for consecutive days uh, for managing these flukes. Pancreatic bladder, again, is uh, uh, very uh, less commonly seen. The pancreatic bladder is an abnormal extension of the pancreatic duct. Of course, this requires surgical exploration and, uh, you know, um, usually not seen much and there are no anecdotal report in our country. Nodal hyperplasia should be definitely, uh, you know, uh, differentiated from uh, acute pancreatitis because there also you have a nodular uh, look but uh, you have to change, uh, generally seen in old dogs and there will be absence of capsule in nodal hyperplasia. Thank you. This is uh, with regard to exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. Usually exocrine pancreatic insufficiency is seen in German shepherds, coolies and uh, other uh, crossbreds of uh, European and Asian breeds, which are not seen in India much and they are seen in young dogs mostly and uh, this is uh, because of lack of uh, enzymes reaching the intestines. Either there can, there can be acinar atrophy, which is 50% of the cases is acinar atrophy. In other 50% of the cases, there can be a block of uh, pancreatic duct in different, different causes which we have discussed, which can lead on to a lack of enzymes in the intestines. These lack of enzymes uh, will uh, go in for uh, malnutrition, malabsorption, uh, and so the, uh, the the pet doesn't put on weight, uh, poor uh, you know uh, skin coat, and uh, they don't thrive. And the, the, those are the reasons why the pet has been brought to you. And uh, the classical uh, uh, test is trypsin-like immunoreactivity, which is uh, fully diagnostic. And um, there are no much uh, strength. Of course, uh, clinical signs are more suggestive, like. Uh, uh, loose motions, foul smelling uh, motions, physical examination of borboric mus or all some uh, indications of uh, exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. And the only choice of treatment is uh, pancreatic enzyme in the form of powders. You have to definitely see to that that a powder which you give has got enough lipase, 70,000 units of lipase uh, you should be able to give. Uh, and, you know, uh, cyanocobalamin uh, injection, as I told you, uh, one injection every every week for six weeks. Thereafter, one injection till about uh, 16 weeks, then recheck on 20 weeks. Cyanocobalamin deficiency is there. You have to give cyanocobalamin and so on. In the absence of uh, powder, you can also give, uh, you know, cow, pig or, you know, uh, pancreas can be given uh, with 30 grams per kg body weight. For 10 kg body weight, you can add into the foot and give uh, daily. So, this is a treatment of uh, uh, exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. If you have any doubts in acute pancreatitis and exocrine pancreatic insufficiency, kindly ask. Thank you very much for the patient hearing.